Uh, I'm Marnie. I'm Austin. We're pitching Fleur because our portfolio is ready to flourish. <laughs> so our recommendation was a buy. Um, the current price it was selling at it's a little bit lower. It was uh, 37.89 um, this morning. But when I made the slides, it was 38.10. Um, target price we have is uh, $43.07. Um, this is a graph of their kind of performance over the past five years. Um, they have had a big drop, which we'll get to um, recently, which is why the stock price is so low, which is why it's a better time to buy it now. So the reason that we think this is a company that we should um, buy, tag on to, is because, like I said, the trading price is low. They had some poor 2018 performance. They did not meet their earnings estimates, so their stock price kind of plummeted. It was about 40% there, 44%. Um, but they still have a strong history of awarded contracts. This company's been around for, um, with the parent company, over 100 years, just by themselves. It's been up almost 20 now. Um, they're financially sound, as far as we found with all their metrics that we've compared to um, other companies. They just they just simply had a poor year and are kind of facing the consequences of that. What's this company do? Oh, sorry. Um, they're an engineering um, company. <laughs> engineering, construction. Um, they work everything from oil and gas to chemicals, petrochemicals, mining metals, transportation. They do advanced manufacturing. Um, they also do management services after they um, after they help you build everything. So they do maintenance and everything else. Sorry. <laughs> Right. So, um, like Austin was saying, they've been around for over 100 years. They were founded in 1912 by Mr. Fleur himself, and they incorporated in the year 2000. Um, they started out by building facilities for the oil and gas industry, but in the 1960s, they actually expanded into the oil and, and drilling and mining, uh, not just making the facilities for other companies. In the 80s, they uh, sold their oil operations and expanded into a construction segment. Um, in the 90s, they introduced new services, including equipment rentals, nuclear waste cleanup, um, their different segments, uh, the diversified services, the energy and chemicals. They kind of, they just kind of went all different directions. Uh, they currently have over 60,000 employees, and they serve over 4,000 clients in over 100 countries. And uh, they're an admired and ethical company. We'll get into that later as well. So as far as the segments, uh, we have the energy and chemicals, which makes up 44.5% of their uh, revenue. The um, diversified, oh, I'm sorry, mining industri industrial infrastructure and power is the 38 and a quarter. Uh, diversified services is 11.5%, and the government is only the 5.75%. So um, revenue was below their estimated um, last year due to two troubling stock contracts. One um, in Florida and one um, that was European. They lost about $81 million between the two of those. Essentially, they just kept um, needing drawback after drawback. They missed the deadline. It was a fixed, um, it was a fixed uh, price contract. So anything past that point, they were just pulling out of their pocket there. Um, which is why um, they're also their backlog is important. So they have they have all these contracts that they're expecting um, that they've been awarded that they haven't done the work on yet. These projects can still be canceled. And then the way they report this figure is also in gross revenue, so it doesn't consider their operating expenses um, yet. But they, um, you can see that they still have right up in here uh, the quarter three. So they don't, their most recent financial statement was actually in December of this past year. Um, we haven't gotten a quarter one statement for them yet. It should be coming out in the next month. Um, but they have work that is ready to be done. They just haven't performed it yet. So there's there's money in their pocket. They, they just need to, to do the work to get it, essentially. Um, like I said, their history of awarded contract, which helps go into their backlog. Um, they just recently have gotten um, several new projects, which we'll get to in the news. But some previous work that they've done, I mean, they've worked at a variety of things. They've done tram systems for um, the Denver airports. Um, they've done power um, generations, nuclear stations, um, oil and pro oil production expansion. And they do a lot of government work. Um, there are two, two big um, revenue sources for the US government and Exxon Mobil for 2018. And it was 18 and 17% respectively there. Um, the US government, it's, it's a pretty um, solid 
I guess, work. If they don't get canceled, it, it's pretty likely that the U.S. government is actually going to pay you know, their, their bill. Um, no other client accounted for more than 10% of the revenue, though. So besides those two big guys, they're pretty well diversified across, um, across the world. So these are all the project locations that they have going on right now. It um, switches between mining metals. There are four different segments there. So you can see that they're fairly spread out across the world, which is why um, the, kind of their model, the thing that they pride themselves on is they will go and they'll do the hard contracts that other people might shy away from. And it's kind of gained in the, this reputation that, hey, we'll, we'll, we'll do the things that nobody else can, you know. Um, so financial soundness, the two, um, Two big metrics that I wanted to point out is the accounts receivable turnover. So how quickly that they are actually cashing in on these on these um, contracts, and they're pretty um, pretty consistently beating the average of the of the comparable companies on um, their operating margin. Um, it did fall a little bit there with their revenues, <coughs> but um, it's looking to increase 164 percent is the <coughs> estimate, and then drop back down just a little bit, about 25 percent um, the year after that. But they have 20 years of experience, so it, a company this large, I mean, they're 153 out of 500 on the Forbes Best Companies list. Um, they're not going to go anywhere. They're not going to go bankrupt anytime soon. Okay? They're kind of at the bottom right now, so they really only have room to go up. Um, they also pay consistent dividends, um, which have a decent yield when compared to um, the medium. Nobody else really pays dividends in this construction and engineering. So for our evaluation, we did the dividend discount model, which we got uh, 37.69. We weighted it at 25% because it does pay the consistent dividends like Austin was just talking about. We did the free cash flow to the firm, uh, which we weighted at 50%. Um, and we're expecting the cash flow to increase uh, this, this year in 2019 because they will continue those awards, of the projects they've been awarded. Um, and then we did the relative valuation of the enterprise value to EBITDA, and we did that uh, as weighted 25% because it is slightly skewed, but it's a good overall metric for a construction company. Um, so our weighted average is 4307, and so we stand to gain at least 13% return on our investment. So our investment risks. Um, So the demand for services are dependent on existent, existence of projects. So of course right now they have a number of different projects awarded to them so that they're going to be working on them. Once those are complete, um, you know, it, it obviously depends on what future projects they get awarded or if there are any future projects to be awarded. Um, and then, let's see. The competition in the mining and construction industry, especially global engineering, etc., etc., is highly competitive. So they do have to kind of fight for those awards um, for those projects to be awarded to them. Uh, and then, of course, project execution activities, including any failure to meet schedule or cost estimates, which was their problem in 2018, uh, may result in reduced profits or losses that could have a material impact on their financial condition. And then, of course, if we go in a recession, construction spending will drop substantially, possibly. So. Um, another thing to tag onto the competition, because it's so highly competitive, it kind of drives what kind of contracts they, um, they're forced to accept. So there's a couple different types of contracts. One is a, a fixed income, where it's a, it's a set amount. You know, we're going to pay you $80 million, you do this job for us. We're not going above that. And so that's the kind of the contract that they're um, that they're being forced to accept more and more often, which puts a little bit more of the risk onto them um, versus a, um, it's a variable income, I think is what it was called, um, contract, where essentially if they cancel this contract, you still need to pay us some of this money because we've, we've started to mobilize things, we've started to get, get things in the works and you decided to cancel. But those contracts are becoming less and less because of a higher and higher competition. So, uh there's not any huge news for Fluor, but one of the biggest things is they are just starting to break ground at the Los Angeles International Airport for their automated people mover. It is in conjunction with uh, approximately five other big companies, so they're all doing it together. And then uh, they have been consistently awarded 
the Fortune magazine's world's most admired company's title for the past 19 years, as well as Ethnosphere's Institute's world's most ethical company award for the past 13 years. And this is just kind of a picture of their idea of what they're going to do for the people mover and a people mover elsewhere is kind of what, what it will end up looking like. So the key takeaway is essentially that this company, the reason it's so undervalued right now is because it has such a poor year. And it's not just our model that kind of reaffirmed this. I mean, we were looking at other analysts. They all kind of have had the same thing to say. Um, it's undervalued right now, but if it shows strong performance this coming 2019, then it, it's, it's going to be worth a full file investment. Questions, comments, concerns? So are you concerned about a repeat of this year, given that they are taking more fixed price contracts? Um, not so much. The um, Florida and the, that European contract, they kind of addressed it in the 10K. They've pretty much washed their hands of that situation. They haven't had really any contracts that have been like that in their history. Those were just two kind of out of the blue. Uh, yeah, everything that could have gone wrong in Florida went wrong. So what are their biggest expenses? So the labor, what, what kind of materials are they typically working with? Are they commodities with yeah, subject well, to commodity price fluctuations? I don't think it's so much commodity because I mean there's so much um, engineering and construction. I mean so it's the price of oil, it's the price of steel, it's the price of aluminum, it's all those kind of commodities. Uh, sorry, I guess sorry, wrong word. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking of, I don't know what I was thinking no, of. But, yeah, it's, it's the price of all of those things that drive their expenses as well. And then, you know, they have to keep um, skilled labor, so that's also a, a, a I guess a higher expense for them. You know, if you keep smart engineers on hand, you're going to get projects done well and done quick. Are all their projects, uh, do they both do the engineering work and the construction, or are those two different divisions of their business? Or are there some just yeah. engineering, some just construction? Uh, they do it all. I, I didn't realize that maybe it might be a separate division, but I assume, you know, they have different managers kind of working on that. But they do everything from upstream, downstream, midstream. Kind of it's all under the same segments, okay. but yes, they might be. I think the question there is more, I anticipate there would be a different manager running a team of engineers versus a construction team. The question is more, do they have some projects where they only do engineering and some projects where they only do construction, or is it always a full service? You know, it's, it's, it's a mix, yes. Yeah, sometimes they'll only work with the construction bit of it. Um, sometimes they will do the management side of it. It kind of depends contract to contract, the way I understood with the different contracts that they've been awarded. They seem to be doing a little bit different things each time. Okay. Um, and then uh, you showed a map of where all their projects are. Did they give any sort of indication of how much of their revenue comes from different regions or different countries? That was in the 10K. Um, I didn't post that up here. I have that pulled up if you want that. Yeah. So, let's see here, the following table says four. Okay, so the United States make about 12 million, Asia Pacific about three, sorry, three billion. Um, Europe, Africa, and Middle East is uh, 19.3 or 9.3 billion, and then America is 16.2 billion. So they seem pretty evenly spread? Yeah, besides, um, yeah, between the United States, yeah, if you add up. America's excluding the United States, yeah. It's between that and the United States where they get the majority, the least being the Asian Pacific. Okay. So we have some currency risk here mm -hmm. because they're probably earning money uh, in foreign currency. Mm -hmm. um, commodity price risk, um, which I might be a little bit concerned about. Um, in terms of customer concentration, I'm not as concerned when it says that the government is one of their largest customers, because I'm not sure if that means the federal government on a single project or if that's describing all the various government contracts. And it was um, just the U.S. government and its, um, not subsidiaries, but uh, a different Sub agencies. Subsidiaries. That, yeah, subsidiaries and uh, the other agencies. So I'm less concerned that. about that because that means uh, it's not only the federal government, but also Los Angeles County and some other entities. Um, but it does seem like they have significant exposure to the oil industry. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think about that in terms of how it fits in our portfolio? Because this is in the industrial sector, and we have also energy exposure to oil and gas. Do, do you think this is a company that uh, the price will fluctuate with the price of oil since they 
see me do quite a lot of work for the oil and gas sector. I can definitely see that happening, you know, um, but I don't think it is a significant source of their income, but their newly awarded contracts that they were looking at, it was um, less of those new contracts were in the oil and gas, it was more in the mining industrials and um, the third. Mining industrials, infrastructure, and power is their newly awarded contracts, so I don't see that having as big of an impact, although it will still have a significant impact. Okay. Um, and why did you guys choose accounts receivable turnover as one of the, the ratios you wanted to look at? The way we imagined it is that they're collecting, that's often they collect essentially on these contracts. Um, so, I'm going to anticipate that a lot of these contracts for large projects like building the people mover at the Los Angeles airport are contracts that are not uh, completed within one year. Right. Um, so you're looking at something that's probably usually recorded as like an unearned revenue liability. It's it's not accounts okay. receivable. This is where going this is where having an accountant on your team is helpful. Um, so I see the logic and where you're going with that, but it maybe isn't the best metric to look at. Um, so tell me about these comps that you used. Uh, we used ACOM, uh, which is ACM, M4, Group Incorporated, that's EME, uh, Jacobs Engineering Group Incorporated, Quanta Services Incorporated, KBR Incorporated. How did you pick these companies? So they're all multinational engineering firms. Um, a lot of them are still as well on the Fortune 500 company list. Um, most of them are American-based. Um, Bluer is out of Texas. Um, most of the other companies that we choose are also based in the United States, but um, work globally. Um, as for their market cap, they all have fairly similar market cap. I think we, I uh, can't remember off the top of my head, but one was a large market cap, one was a little bit smaller, and the other three were pretty close to their same market cap. So for size, we thought that would be helpful. Um, as for the other ones, we looked at price earnings, right? Oh, price dollar forward earnings, uh, which goes off of their backlog, which is a better comparison to just regular price to earnings. Um, because it takes into account all that cash that they are potentially waiting to gain. So I might want some more information on what exactly went wrong with these two contracts. Okay. Um, and I think you might want to actually compare these comps in terms of backlog um, or just kind of what's in their pipeline um, to give a bit of a better representation of kind of because these are long cycle businesses and otherwise they all have these long term contracts. So you probably already have a good estimate of what their earnings are going to look like in the future, this, assuming they don't have a repeat, they have Massive cost so regions, comparison right? of revenues versus price earnings? Um, I would actually look, most of these, it's not a gap measure, but companies like this typically report like a pipeline or backlog um, of contracts. Um, so I'd probably use that and compare it to some of these comps to just see that they're healthy and they're still winning business. Okay. Questions from class? Comments from class? So if they take on like the hardest jobs that nobody else wants to do, how often do they go over budget? So that was uh, something that we did think about. They haven't had a, um, they've done surprisingly well doing those hard jobs. There hasn't really been problems with that. Um, it's, it's, they work in these, these hard to reach places. Um, they, you know, they work in the Middle East, they work in like Kazakhstan, places that can kind of be uh, unsafe, I guess, and pretty volatile, but they've managed it very mm -hmm. well. Like, do you know what their retention rate is for engineers? I don't Did know. For, about no, that? no, I didn't read anything about that. Um, but they did mention that that was one of the risk factors is that they have to kind of minimize turnover because it's hard to train those people. And then last question for their contracts that you said that they have lined up. Do you know what they are and how risky they are? What the chance of profitability for them? Is? So we only listed those newest yeah, ones. Yeah, the, the absolute newest ones. It's under the. Uh, Additional catalysts and news. That's so those are the three. There's a new energy plant in the UK, uh, an engineering procurement and construction management services contract uh, in the Netherlands, and then of course the automated people mover. But those are just the absolute most recent that they. Yeah, I don't have a comprehensive list of their new new awarding contracts. So, 
Um, you said that like they're willing to like they're willing to do the harder jobs and stuff like that. Do you have your number one investment risk as um, the the dependence upon existence of projects? Is that um, is that a big worry or well, did it's, you say it's, it's a worry for every every company in this region because or every company in this category because <coughs> you never know when you're gonna when there's gonna work's gonna come up you never know when you're gonna get these contracts and so that kind of makes it fluctuate a little bit that's why um, it's more important to look on what's already awarded because um, then you have a better understanding of what we can expect in the future um, based on what we already have because yeah you don't know when the U S government's gonna want to create more roads or create another power plant and they, they kind of have to take it as they come. Um, so you mentioned that they do uh, a lot of mining and they're getting more into that. Do they own their own commodity I guess, acquisitions? Do they own the mine that they're going to pull their steel from? Do they own any oil rigs or refineries that they're going to pull from directly to buy as Well, they, they got like out that? of the, the mining portion because they had been building the facilities for them, and then they got into them themselves, but then 20 years later, they were getting out of that. So at this point, they're mostly back into doing it for building the facilities for other people and, and all that. Okay. Well, change a little bit of the commodity risk there. They own their yeah. own. Um, we'll check and then also, what's in the government bucket? Because there was one slide you mentioned it's right here, actually. The U.S. government was 18%, but then yeah, two that, three slides before the government was 5% of the revenue, which... Uh, they don't. Uh, yeah. So this one, I just want to just pay and five seventy-five. Different numbers. So is this yeah, one just, just, just that was last year and that was from the twenty eighteen ten k. Okay. Go to the other chart. Uh, revenue here. And this is backlog. Okay. So the contracts they've yet to execute all but kind of signed. Okay. So two different metrics. So. That's actually a good thing to kind of point out. It looks like maybe they're growing their government segment. Yeah. So as a class, you can decide if you think that's attractive or not. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I just missed it, but a big thing is they're an ethical company. What exactly makes them ethical? So they did, um, they've done work. They were put back on um, Puerto Rico and had that hurricane go through. They did work with Hurricane Katrina. So they'll do like that. Um, Almost like humanitarian, you know, we're a good company. And I think that's more important. I think a lot of people start to look at that more now. If you look at all these utility companies that when there's an accident, they just, uh, sorry, you know, that nobody likes that. So if you have a company that's trying to do something and trying to take care of the place that they live, I think people, people like that. Um, do they get paid for these fixed price contracts um, over the time period of the project, or is it in a lump sum before or after? Um, I believe it's on upon completion. Um, yeah. That wasn't. It was kind of a muddling through. It's it's kind of the terms of each contract are negotiated for a long time. Okay. So each of those could be a little bit different. Um, there's not they're not really general. 